now. Welcome everyone. I'm Dr. Emmanuel Ledoux. Uh, this is Arrhythmia Cyber Chats. We do this every Friday, 7 p.m. Eastern. And the goal is to create awareness about cybersecurity, share knowledge, and help uh, all cybersecurity professionals within our community and outside our community uh, to become the best cybersecurity professionals that uh, you can ever become, right? So uh, we are here to share knowledge, to discuss. Uh, if you have any contributions, please raise your virtual hand and we will allow you to uh, share your inputs, right? I appreciate everybody's time. It's Friday night, we could have been anywhere uh, else, but you chose to be here to help, you know, spread the love and share the knowledge in the security space. So uh, tonight's topic, we will be looking at SOC, SOC, and how to become a SOC analyst, what are some of the skill sets that you need, but we will dive deep into the operations of SOC itself. Uh, and then we will look at, you know, how to, pursue a career in that space. Right, so let's get started. Uh, I'm Dr. Emmanuel Ledu. If you are new to the family, um, a former United States Army captain, I'm the CEO of Arrhythmus Inc, a QSA company uh, and a cybersecurity consultant firm based in New York. And I'm the founder of Arrhythmus Academy. And I love to teach. Uh, I love to mentor and train. Uh, I'm really passionate about leadership and mentoring and helping. Uh, also, I was pretty professionals. So enough about myself for tonight. We will be looking at uh, SOC analysts or SOC uh, as a uh, security operations center. And we are going to look at uh, people who work within that center. What skill set do you need and what do they do? What are the levels uh, that they have in there in terms of uh, roles and responsibilities? Uh, but before we jump into it, we also look at cyber news for the week. And then we will look at you know, everything that is listed on here. So types of uh, SOC, uh, SOC tools and the rest, not in that order, but we have more to cover tonight, right? So uh, I hope everybody is going to gain something out of this discussion at the end of the chat. Right? So we are going to start with our cyber news. For this week, uh, there are a lot of cyber news as usual, but we picked the ones uh, that we deem fit for uh, our purpose. So Intel was in the news, and guess what? In the Intel got hit with a fine uh, of 400 million uh, euros, uh, 400 million dollars, which is equivalent to 376 million euros. And the reason for this was that they were trying to, uh, they were trying to kick their competitors uh, out of the market, and it's against uh, Europe's competition rule. So uh, this happened. You know, it is. Uh, it happened uh, November 2022, between November 2022 and December 2026. Uh, yeah, 20, uh, 2006. So 2002 and 2006, uh, we are in the 2020s. So, uh, but they were, you know, I think like the case was in court back and forth. Initially, I think uh, the European uh, agency, the European Commission was looking for almost $1 billion but the judge threw that out of court and then they settled on this one. So this one, indeed, they were found guilty and they had to pay this money, right? Simply because they were trying to, you know, uh, kick or trying to push their competitors out of the market. And the allegation was that they paid uh, Intel, HP, uh, the Intel paid HP, uh, Asa and uh, Le Lenovo. They gave them money to either halt or to delay uh, using products from the arrivals, right? And Intel, if you don't know what Intel does, I mean, they are big in the security, huge in the security space. They produce chips that we use in computers and other devices, right? So uh, Intel trying to push everybody out of the market resulted in this, but this money is still really nothing compared to what Intel has made from 202 till now, right? It is really nothing. So next in the news, we are talking about lawsuits uh, for uh, tonight's uh, cyber chat. So another lawsuit uh, in the cyberspace is chat GPT. So what are they in court for? So chat GTP, uh, GPT, they've been in court, uh, they've been sued left, right, center, simply because of data, right? Uh, some people are claiming they are, using their, their, their data without their permission to train uh, their 
uh, AI, which is Chad uh, GPT. So they seal the mother company, which is Open AI. And uh, not, I mean, you can't seal Chad GPT uh, is a product, not a company on its own. So they seal the, 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 the company that created Chad GPT and they are in court and they were, uh, guess who sealed them, right? The, like the writers of Game of Thrones, you know? So writers of Game of Thrones, they claim uh, chat GPT, the uh, open AI is using their data, like their books to train their uh, AI without their permission, right? So I think everybody has seen where uh, chat GPT is going with this and the money that might come out of it. But also if you are using somebody's data uh, unlawfully, you have to you know pay for it so they also in court for this uh, this was uh, i think on tuesday this week right so uh, they are in court on tuesday this week was when they filed uh, this case and 17 other writers have also joined because they think uh, open ai is not uh, asking the right permissions or is not paying for uh, their intellectual property that they are using right so they are infringing on their copyrights so uh, this week was just full of lawsuits. Uh, with that, we are going to move into our topic for tonight. So what is Security Operations Center, right? Uh, SOC. Now in cybersecurity, they are, when we say, you know, when you see SOC for the acronym, it can mean two things, right? Uh, security Operations Center is one. What is the other one? Anybody knows? or one dollar. The other one, uh, when system, we talk about this, we'll see. System and organization control. Service organization uh, compliance. Okay, say that again. The first one and then the second one, please. System, uh, system and organization controls. Okay, and then the other one is what? Service organization. Compliance. Service organizational control. Yes. So service organizational control and system uh, and organization, they are, they are two, like they are both uh, like one of the same, right? One more. Yes. Uh, anybody else? Is there any system other on SOC chip. that I'm not aware of? System on chip. Yes. <laughs> yes, true. True. Yep. And, but I think like that is a uh, big S, small O, and a big C. I think. Is it still SOC? Yeah, it's yeah, still right. SOC. <laughs> it's still SOC. Uh, any other SOCs that maybe we do not know about? Sorbet and Oxley? I'm not sure. <laughs> so, like, that is X, not C. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, I got it. Okay, that sorry. That is S-O-X. Yes. yes. All right. All right, everyone. I appreciate everybody. Uh, so, you know, that shows that everybody is paying attention and we are all learning. Right. So uh, now when it comes to acronyms in cybersecurity, there is a whole range of them. And one acronym can mean like three things. Another example is uh, MAC, M-A-C. There are different meanings to that. Right. So mostly you have to look at it in context. Yes, MAC on its own can mean any, anything. So even if you are taking a certification exam and you see that, you have to you know, understand the context of the question to be able to pick you all understand what MAC uh, in there means, right? And also for acronyms, I'll encourage everybody to, uh, you have to actively memorize them because in certification exams and the rest, sometimes you have a question and all the answers will just be acronyms. And if you don't remember what those acronyms uh, stand for, then obviously you are going to get the question wrong. So uh, we are going to dive deep into uh, Security Operation Center tonight. So this picture depicts what a security operation center looks today. Uh, now, in a physical security operation center, it will look like this. Uh, now we have different types of it. It can be virtual, it can be outsourced to somebody else and the rest. So we will look at all that as we move forward, right? So uh, where did we start, you know, and where did we come from to get to the fancy uh, security operation center uh, that we were just looking at, right? So way back in the day, we had security operation centers still because we are constantly in warfare, 
right now the warfare is being fought uh, in the cyberspace so uh we are kind of evolving you know we've evolved over time now they started uh we always have to you know uh in the in our line of defense whether physical or logical we always have to have some uh, level of defense right and uh one of those level of defense is to conduct surveillance and gather intelligence right and to kind of game plan or uh, guesstimate threats and plan accordingly for that so these structures that we see here i know everybody knows what uh, they are used for and they are meant for people who work in these structures they cannot afford to sleep or to doze off right they don't have that luxury you don't go in here to play on your cell phone or to you know uh, chill put on put chill or hang out or watch netflix this is not the place to do that nor this place is the place to do that why because if you're up in here you have to be alert you have to be you know on the lookout you have to look at whatever is you know uh in your line of sight because you are going to be the first line of defense when an attacker is coming uh, the way of you know whichever city country or uh army or group that you are trying to protect right so uh security operation centers they kind of started similar to this and we still have this you know don't get that wrong and they all still kind of contribute to uh security operation centers that we have uh in the military uh, setup and then also but for us as security professionals uh, in in the cyberspace i mean we can we still have to protect you know fiscal security is part of uh cyber security and information security but when we are looking at it from the logical point of view we are doing the same thing right we are constantly looking uh on the horizon trying to see if there are any threats coming our way and we are going to attack or we are going to handle those incidents uh, if we can handle some of those before if we can prevent them before they actually materialize or if they do happen how do we handle that you know in a very swift manner so that is the idea and the basis behind our security operation uh, centers and sometimes they might look like this uh, in the military setting so gathering intelligence looking through your binos identifying if the enemy is coming or they are some drones running around and reporting and sending you know uh, information uh, up the chain right so escalating uh, any incident that you might or in something that you might identify uh, for further investigation, right? So let's get into the actual definition of security operation centers. So security operation centers, uh, before, you know, we all got fancy, uh, it used to be a natural building where people work within it. So we had like security professionals working in that building or that facility. It is still there, right? But there are different types of it now where we have like virtual security operation centers as well but your typical security operation centers looks like what we saw in the picture right so it looks your typical security operation center will look like this maybe sometimes not as spacious as this or as fancy but it's still a security operation center and in today's day and age and you know because of COVID and all other factors we are able to do the same setup at home right so you can have different people you know setting this up at home and working and watching traffic and seeing what is going on and reporting accordingly right now security operation centers they are also sometimes referred to as information security operation centers so uh i SOC or just SOC. Uh, so uh, information if you see information security operation centers is the same thing that we are referring to right now is a facility uh that houses security professionals and technology that we are going to use to monitor, analyze, and respond to cyber threats or information security threats uh, around the clock. So this, they do everything in real time. And mostly for security jobs, for uh, your security operation centers, they mostly do 12 hour shifts, right? So 24 seven, there is somebody or there is a group in there who are constantly watching and making sure that, you know, threats are being uh, mitigated and incidents are being handled and all that right so uh if the if you, we see soc in this context of uh, security protection analyzing and identifying threats 
uh, then we should know that our security operation centers uh, is what we are referring to. And this now it can be a building with people working in it. It can be a company, actually. It can be a full-blown software supported by a group of security professionals as well. We will look at all those dynamics uh, as we move along. Right? So, uh, like I said, uh, your SOC team can be working remote. They can be in a building, a normal security operation center setup as well. Right? So, but they work around the clock to ensure that your company is safe and your company's security posture uh, stays on the right side of security. Now, what is the main goal of, you know, for companies setting up uh, a security operations center? So the main goal is to gain high visibility on everything that is going on in terms of threats, the threat landscape, right? Uh, to be able to, to proactively uh, try to mitigate some of these uh, threats before they materialize. And then also not just the threats, mostly we can, we can only guesstimate or we can uh, estimate or we can predict how threats is going to behave, but we don't really have any control over that, right? So mostly we have to mitigate or reduce our vulnerabilities within our setup, right? Uh, for us to be successful. But the goal of uh, any SOC setup or any SOC team is to identify or have a good you know, handle when it comes to threats the threat landscape, and then also monitoring traffic, uh, reducing or uh, monitoring traffic handling incidents as well, right? So, and they do this in real time. They handle incidents, all incidents are handled uh, under your incident response team, but it starts from the SOC, uh, the SOC team or the SOC group, and then it will escalate to your incident response when it becomes a full-blown uh, incident that, they, that cannot be handled uh, just by your SOC analyst, right? So your SOC uh, team is mostly made up of a combination of uh, different security professionals with different backgrounds and different skill sets. You know, so we are going to look at the key functions of uh, a SOC. So uh, SOC team or the SOC itself, uh, Security Operations Center. What do they do? What are their key functions? So right in this diagram, we can see uh, prevention and proactive monitoring. Uh, security intelligence, so they do gather intelligence for, and that is all part of the proactiveness of what they do. Uh, recovery and remediation, the incidents, uh, handling incidents is one of their uh, babies. Now, the most important thing that, you know, uh, SOC helps the whole entire security group with is alerts, right? Uh, they have their technologies and systems set in and their tools to pick up on certain types of threats and uh, incidents really uh, at, at a very good pace, right? Or uh, in real time, that way we can easily react to it and they manage all the alerts as well, right? Uh, log management, compliance, uh, security posture, refinement, and uh, intelligence, uh, security intelligence, gathering, uh, recovery and remediation, we talked about that. So remediation and recovery obviously go hand in hand with incidents response. Right, so these are the key functions of a SOC uh, group or your SOC infrastructure that you might have in your company. This is what they are supposed to do. So uh, we looked at almost all of these. So uh, still looking at it by list, not the diagram, designing and implementing security solutions. Now, something that the diagram didn't touch, touch on, which kind of also is part of what they do is developing and implementing security policies and procedures. Right, awareness training, huge one, huge, huge, huge one. Right, awareness training is part of the proactiveness uh, of ensuring that your staff, uh, your employees, they know what they are supposed to do and what they are not supposed to do. Uh, analyzing log, network traffic, uh, that is a given. That is what they do on daily basis. Uh, performing vulnerability assessments, yes, providing threat intelligence reports, also as, that is also part of some of the key functions of. A SOC team, right? So for uh, the SOC team, aside, you know, we are going to look at like the different uh, components of a SOC team, but uh, as part of their duties, they can also conduct uh, forensics investigation, malware analysis, and the rest, in addition to uh, what we looked at already. And then also threat hunting is also part of, uh, is at tier three, yes, uh, tier three, 
when it comes to the different uh, levels of tier, which we are going to look at here shortly. So when it comes to uh, handling security incidents, uh, the SOC team has it, you know, broken down into, into different levels and they call it tiers, right? So into different levels, they have like key functions that they perform, but they've broken it down. That is why uh, when you, you see some uh, job titles such as uh, security analyst or SOC, SOC analyst uh, tier one, SOC analyst tier two, SOC analyst tier three. So if you are wondering uh, what is tier one, what is tier two, what is tier three, we are going to break it down here for you to understand. Right? So uh, for the handling of incidents, uh, they've structured or they have like a tier structure that helps them to account for uh, what they are going to do if there is an incident that they have to handle, right? And also for every tier, there is a certain level of skill and experience that you need, right? To be able to function in that space. So tier one is triaging, right? You can look at it more from the perspective of what we do, what nurses and doctors and the health professionals do uh, at the hospital as well, right? If you go to the emergency, they are doing triaging. When people come in, when there is an, like a, so the emergency will call an incident. Right when there is an incident, you know somebody just fell. Uh, they raise the person in there. What do they do? So in the emergency, they learn how to do triage, right? And what is triage? Now, uh, Randall comes in with a broken nose. Uh, somebody else, John, comes in with a broken arm. Uh, another person, Michael, comes in with blood just you know gushing out of his neck. Which of these people? They all came in at the same time. Which of these people do we attend to first, right? So you can say, okay, if there are three nurses, then they all look at. So what if it's not just, we have three nurses, but then we have like 15 people coming at the same time with different levels of problems. Which one do we look at first? That is what, what we do uh, for triaging, right? Being able to prioritize and streamline, okay, which ones are we tackling first? Which one is life-threatening? Because if somebody is just, you know, bleeding from their arteries. They might probably, you know, die if you don't treat them in the next maybe five, uh, four, one to five minutes or something uh, as compared to somebody with a broken nose. I mean, it's, a broken nose is also a problem, but compared to somebody who is bleeding, if you are losing blood at that rate, uh, your chances of survival is a bit slim. So we are not going to waste time treating somebody's broken nose whilst you know somebody's bleeding to death right so same thing here uh when there is an incident or when something happens uh we have to look at whether it's an event or a natural incident even for incidents we have different uh criticalities right so different criticalities when it comes to incidents now uh level one in when it comes to uh the sub ts level one is triage we are going to explain uh, more into that level two is investigation level three is threat hunting and it goes in this order so uh level three is above level two level one is below level two right so anything that happens level one uh once level one handles it and is out of their expertise they'll push it up to level two right and level two will handle it and then push it up to level three so that is how it works now we are going to look at it individually so for uh level one that is for triage uh, and for level one, if you work within the level one space, you are a SOC analyst level one, right? So for level one uh, is the first level when it comes to uh, your security operation center. And for tier one uh, personnel, they are responsible for triaging uh, incoming security incidents, just like how we broke it down with the hospital scenario, right? Uh, it includes identifying the source of the problem, the source of the incidents, uh, the scope of the damage or the scope of the incident, uh, assessing the impact to our network, to our organization. And then uh, what they also do is they will escalate it to the next uh, level. So uh, for their responsibilities for a tier one analyst, your responsibility after identifying, so you are going to do some identification. Uh, you're also going to you know, uh, identify the scope you are going to identify the impact or may kind of, you know, guesstimate the impact. And then you are going to, you are responsible for providing initial response. So if it is something that they can handle at their level, 
they will easily handle it, right? Uh, they try to do some of the containment as well, which uh, if you know the incident response steps, uh, you should you will be able to easily understand this or function in there. Uh, if you don't know, for incident response steps, uh, anybody from any of our uh, not uh, security, uh, uh, in anybody from the internship, not the PCR internship, but for the cybersecurity entry level internship, uh, who has gone through incident response? If you can list or tell everybody what the list of uh, items you have to cover when it comes to incident response, how do we respond to incidents? What are the steps? You can raise your virtual hand. Uh, anybody in here who wants to help out? Oh, I can just pick somebody from the list that I, I can easily remember. Oh, anybody? Yeah, preparation, detection, and identification, containment, mm -hmm. eradication, recovery. Yes. Yes, thank you. So uh, we first have to, if there is a problem, we have to, we first have we first have to uh, identify and verify the problem, right? To make sure, okay, indeed. Is an event or is an incident? If it's an event, we don't really escalate it to another level. We just solve it right there. If it's an incident and we can still, so if it's an incident, then we are going to go full blown into the steps when it comes to incidents uh, response. So if it's an incident, we've confirmed that we've done our investigation, identified and investigated that, then we are going to move into containment. If there is a fire and we confirm there is a fire, we have to make sure the fire stays where it is. It's not going to spread, right? So we contain it right there. So the incident, you know, will be the fire that we are talking about. We have to contain it. Now, after we've contained it, we have to get rid of it. So eradication, we have to eradicate the problem. And then once eradication is done, we've been able to get rid of the problem. We move into recovery because we have to bring back uh, or we have to reinstate the original state that our system or our kitchen was in, right? That way we can so uh, go back and still make it work uh, as it used to. Although we are not going to get it exactly as it was, it's going to take time, but these are the steps. So we have to uh, first, so is your uh, so, SOC tier one, uh, they are going to do the identification uh, to confirm the extent, what type, uh, the source. And then once that is done, they also have to contain it, right? So uh, they will provide the initial response and containment measures. And then from there, they are going to escalate it to, uh, if they are not able to eradicate it at their level, they are going to push it up and for further investigation to really, because the more you know about the problem, the easier it becomes for you to solve or eradicate the problem, right? So uh, they all work seamlessly between your tier one, tier two, and tier three. Right, so for tier one, uh, that is what you are going to be doing uh, in this space. Now for experience level for tier one, tier one, uh, they are the least experienced when it comes to the tiers, tier one to three. Uh, tier one is obviously the least uh, experienced, but then also tier one uh, mostly takes a lot of time. Sometimes depending on the type of incident, uh, tier one and tier two, they take most of the time when it comes to handling uh, SOC uh, incidents that might occur, right? So uh, your tier one typically lists uh, experience analysts and their primary function is to monitor logs and events for suspicious activities, but then they go a little bit, you know, beyond that, right? Now, depending on how the organization have it set up and how your SOC team, you know, uh, operates, sometimes some of the duties for tier one, tier two, there will be a little bit of overlap, right? Uh, but specifically for tier one, you are just, you are the first point of call. So uh, you don't have that luxury of sleeping or chilling on the job. You have to be active and you have to be somebody who really pays attention to detail. So we are going to move on to tier two. So tier two is the investigation uh, portion of this. Now, uh, it is a second level when it comes to SOC, your service, your uh, security operation center uh, team. Your level two is the investigation 
Uh, tier two is the investigation. Now, tier two personnel, they are responsible for investigating the security incidents and also determining the root cause. If you know the root cause, is you are uh, almost, I think you're almost like 80% uh, there when it comes to eradicating the problem. If you know the root cause, you'll be able to uh, easily uh, put you know, that fire uh, off, right? So it's like, if there's a fire and you know the source of the fire, if it was electric, if it was the gas, if it was, you know, you know the type of fire extinguisher to use. If you don't, you probably be, you know, using the wrong type of fire extinguisher and the, and the fire is not going to go out, right? So uh, it includes analyzing logs, network traffic, data, and data sources, identifying the source of the incident. But some of these uh, might have been a little bit, or they, they might have had a lead from tier one, right? So uh, you just pick it from there and dig deeper into it. And tier two personnel, they are also responsible for providing a detailed incident response report and recommendations for remediation, right? Tier three also does similar thing when it comes to incident uh, response reports and also recommendations for remediation, right? So we will move into tier three. Now tier three uh, is threat hunting. So tier three, they are more proactive, right? Whilst tier one and two are trying to figure out and solve their problems. Uh, they are also on the other side, they are also being they are also being very proactive by actively hunting for threats, right? Uh, hunting for threats and trying to identify vulnerabilities that might exist within the organization, right? And they also do they say similar to what a tier two would do, analyzing logs, networks, data sources. And the rest, but their goal uh, is they don't wait for an incident to happen before they do that, or they don't wait for something to have happened. They constantly do that on a daily basis to help identify uh, and gather more threat uh, intelligence to help the company to be more proactive, right? So they provide detailed threat intelligence reports and recommendations uh, as well for remediation, right? So for tier three, uh, that is what they do. And for tier three, they are the most experienced when it comes to the levels, right? They are the most experienced and they also support complex incident response and they spend, you know, the rest of their time trying to uh, do some forensics uh, based on the data that they've gathered. And also if, you know, they detect any suspicious uh, activities from, you know, uh, the activities that will help with the proactiveness part of helping uh, the organizational security question, right? So, like I was saying, on average, uh, companies will spend more time when it comes to tier one and tier two uh, activities than tier three. But tier three should also have a good chunk of time because uh, you have to stay ahead of the bad guys. You have to stay ahead of malicious actors, right? So you have to be more proactive. And tier three analysts are going to be the ones who are going to help us to do that. So with that, we are going to look at a quick summary of everything that we looked at. So for tier one, uh, predominantly you are monitoring, uh, you are opening tickets, you are closing false positives. So some of the reason why you'll be identifying or you'll be doing the initial investigation into uh, supposedly incidents is maybe probably it will be a false positive, it's probably not an incident. Uh, so you just go ahead and close that out. And basic you know, investigation and mitigation is what you are going to do for a tier one analyst. For tier two, deep investigation uh, that will lead into the incident response team, mitigation and recommendation and, re and recommending changes, and then also uh, mitigation, uh, recommending uh, miti uh, remediation strategies as well. Now tier three, uh, advanced investigation. So anything that is beyond tier two, they are going to push it to tier three. And then for tier three, they are also very proactive, uh, prevention, threat hunting, and uh, threat hunting uh, forensics, counterintelligence and malware uh, reversals as well. Right? So I think everybody has a good warm and fuzzy exactly how these tiers work. So if you're applying for any job and they have uh, SOC analyst tier one, tier two, tier three, you know exactly what you are getting yourself into. Right? So now let's look at when it comes to your security operation center, there are different structures uh, that we are going to look at. So when it comes to the formation of it, Right. Typically, we have four main components uh, that makes up your uh, SOC structure. Right. So within different organizations, the SOC uh, architecture, uh, we have four main components. So the first component 
uh, is a sub, uh, the group that will monitor and that will manage the organization's security posture, right? The second is the security operations manager or the security operation management aspect of it. Uh, the third is the security analyst, uh, analyst and uh, monitoring analysis of logs and the rest uh, part of it. And then the last one, uh, security engineers and architectures, uh, security engineers and architects, you know, who are responsible for implementing, for designing and implementing security solutions to protect the organization's environments, right? So these are the three main, the four main components that will make up every sub team. Right? So now we are going to uh, look at the, uh, the actual team, like the components of the team in terms of people and the roles, right? So for your sub team, uh, it can be uh, in person, it can be uh, outsourced, it can be, uh, we will look at all that, it can be virtual. So that is what uh, this slide is talking about. So, and there is also another concept that is the uh, SOC hub and uh, spoke architect uh, or architecture. So for this, mostly we will have a centralized uh, SOC team, and then we'll have like different or uh, subnets of the SOC team. And what they do, we call those spokes. So what they do is uh, they are going to report to the main hub, which is like the central hub, and they will handle different sectors of the company. And then we have like the main uh, centralized uh, SOC uh, team that will oversee the little sub teams that are there, right? So that is also another way of looking at it, kind of similar to what we have in this picture. So you have your main sub team here, and then you have different, depending on how the organization is structured and how they are you know, spread uh, over the world or over whichever uh, geographical area that they might be in. Now, when it comes to uh, sub responsibilities and roles, we are going to look at this briefly and then we will jump into the actual different roles, right? So based on the four main uh, functional areas uh, in a SOC, uh, we are able to come up with the roles. So you have a SOC manager, you have uh, a compliance uh, auditor, you have an incident responder or incident response uh, team, you have SOC analyst team or group, and you have threat hunters, right? So uh, tier three, sometimes they double up as threat hunters, right? Tier three SOC analyst, they will double up as threat hunters also as well. So for your SOC manager, uh, we are going to look at uh, everybody's uh, as that job role and description, right? But this is just a summary of all of it. So we are just going to move on into. So when it comes to uh, staffing, uh, everything that we looked at is what is on here. So your security manager, uh, your analysts, your incident responders, your uh, engineers and architects and security investigators, we are going to look at them uh, individually. So when it comes to uh, their individual roles, a SOC manager, your job is day-to-day -day, uh, operations of the SOC, right? So developing and implementing security policies and procedures, as well as providing uh, awareness training for the whole entire company and also for your SOC team, right? And everybody within the SOC team. Now for this managerial role is uh, sometimes 70% soft skills and 30% uh, you know technical cyber security like cyber security knowledge you know and skill right so it's a mixture sometimes 60% depending on the company and what they are looking for but for your day to day activities and what you're going to be doing uh, a cast across board is about 60% soft skills because you need to have some leadership and managerial skills so if you have that already coming from another field you can easily leverage yourself together with the, you know, 30%, uh, 40% cyber security knowledge and skill that you have and be able to easily function in there. Now with advanced security analysts, uh, we are looking at your uh, threat hunters or your tier three folks. Uh, they are responsible for proactively hunting for threats and vulnerabilities within the organization's environments. And they do that through analyzing logs, traffic, uh, network traffic and other sources of data to identify potential vulnerabilities. Now, incident responders, uh, they are not part of your SOC analyst group, right? They might have one person from your SOC analyst group, so tier one, tier two, tier three, uh, be part of, we can have one of them being part of the incident response uh, team, right? Which 
you know, rightly so, because they are going to be part of the steps, uh, the, the steps that we just uh, discussed, right? You can have your tier one uh, in there helping with the initial uh, identification and verification of the supposedly incident. And if it's confirmed and they push it up, it is eventually going to come back to your incident response uh, group. So incident responders, they respond to incidents, uh, including identifying the source of the incident, determining the scope and the magnitude of it, and then, you know, doing recovery, remedi uh, doing remediation and uh, the rest. So our engineers, uh, we looked at what they do already. They are responsible for designing, uh, engineers and architects responsible for designing and implementing uh, great, so uh, great security solutions to help the company stay on the right side of security. So uh, the tools that they can put in place and the different layers of defense, uh, firewalls, intrusion detection systems, and different solutions, antivirus, anti-malware, software, and the rest, right? And security investigators, they are kind of your forensics uh, folks. So this will still cut across tier three, uh, they're about, right? So they can be either part of your tier three or, you know, they can be standalone. So they are responsible for in investigating uh, incidents, also taking, uh, digging deeper into it, identifying the root cause and the rest. And they also use logs, analyzing logs, traffic, and the rest as well. Right? Now, uh, aside the typical, you know, uh, list that we saw, the, this is also a list of some of the roles, uh, specialty roles that might also be part of your SOC team, or that might be part of the SOC group, right? So malware uh, analysts or reverse engineers, threat hunters who are mostly going to be in your uh, tier three, or they can also be mapped to tier two. And your forensics uh, analyst or your forensic specialist, your vulnerability managers and consulting roles uh, as well. So this is a diagram breaking this down, you know, making it a bit easy and to make more sense. So you have your incident response uh, coordinator. So you have your tier, tier three, tier two, tier one. Now anything tier one can't handle is escalated to uh, tier two and tier two will also do the same, escalate that to tier three, right? And so as we are moving up, uh, we are decreasing the number, decreasing number and increasing severity, right? So if it is it is not that severe and they can handle it at this level, it's not gonna go up, right? And if we have maybe 10 incidents uh, for, for it to get up here, out of the 10, it's probably gonna be two or three, Right, dependent. So as it's going up, the number of cases or the number of incidents are reducing, but the severity, and if they move it up, it means it's a serious case. So uh, that is what this is uh, referring to. Now, when it comes to collaboration, there's a collaboration between this group and everybody else that we mentioned who are not necessarily going to be uh, within uh, this group, right? So your a blue team specialist, your red team specialist, your security engineers and the rest. And then you have the consultants also down here, right? Also, you know, sharing information and consulting with this team as well. And overall, your SOC manager uh, is going to be responsible for everybody in here. Everybody, everybody in here. That is why you, a lot of soft skills is, is involved for this, right? So you can be the best or you can be the most technical, uh, cyber security person in the world. If you can't manage people or you can't deal with people, look at all the people who are in here with all the moving pieces. Uh, you are going to really mess this up. Right? So if you have a lot of management leadership skills coming in uh, and you want to go into the SOC area, uh, leadership spots or like the managerial position like this can be something that you can look into. Now, your SOC manager reports to the CISO. And everybody else has turned out to this whole group will also uh, be under the CISO. So everybody else will be under CISO and they are going to support. And so that is what uh, this whole diagram looks, uh, is looking uh, like this is the explanation of the whole diagram. Right? So, and also down here, we have some legend for you to look at. So anything black is management role, uh, anything, Blue is technical rules. So all these are technical rules. You need to know your stuff, right? And the yellow is a consulting role. So for consulting role, you are providing advice. You are not necessarily going to be the one doing the work, 
right? So if also you know your stuff, you can also work in the consulting room. So uh, what does it take to become a SOC analyst? That is the big question. Uh, so to excel or to become a SOC analyst, you need to possess some set of skills aside your uh, technical cybersecurity skills or your cybersecurity skills and knowledge in general. You need to be curious. Uh, you need to be willing to spend long hours learning, long hours sitting down, uh, researching and digging into stuff, right? If you are not that type, then uh, this job is not going to be uh, the right fit for you, right? You need to also, uh, so, so for the technical side, you need to know security tools. Now for the tools, I'm not, like I always tell everybody, uh, I'm not very worried, too much worried about the tools. You just need to know some of it. You can't know all the tools. Nobody knows all the tools. But when you get on, like if you know some of it and you get on the job, you can easily, like they will train you on the ones that they have. And sometimes you get there and they are even acquiring more tools. So nobody in their workplace even knows how to use that tool. Everybody has to be trained on, right? So for security tools, yes. Uh, but what is going to set you apart is having a good working knowledge uh, in security, right? Having a good working knowledge in security. For tools, anybody can learn tools. You can teach anybody how to use a tool in a day or two. They will be fine. But if your fundamentals are weak, even using the tools, you run into issues. Now, networking, uh, you have to also, because for the SOC, specifically for the SOC space, uh, you have to be really uh, up to speed when it comes to your, your networking fundamentals. So uh, now let's move into, uh, and also in general, uh, good uh, IT networking. So like that is what I was talking about, networking and security principles. So your fundamental security uh, knowledge and skills, and specifically here, because you are dealing with traffic and you know stuff, you have to also be really up to speed when it comes to networking so it networking not human networking i mean human networking also play a, a very good role here as well but we are going to jump into some major areas like your educational background and the rest so for educational background uh, although we have one here generally uh, bachelor's degree in computer science and information security that is not uh, that is not if you don't have that you can still be a soccer analyst right it's not necessarily a big requirements that if you don't have, uh, you're automatically disqualified. Right? You can have a degree in anything and you can work in cybersecurity. You can have a degree in nothing and still work in cybersecurity. Right? Mostly what employers are looking for is, can you help them move from A to B? Can you actually do the job? You have the knowledge and skill. Right? So if you have a degree in computer science and the rest is a plus, uh, or in any other related area is a plus, uh, if you don't, it's not really going to be a big negative to you, right? And some organization will be looking for certifications, uh, others not so much. So uh, any experience that you have uh, coming from your other transferable skills, you know, your soft skills and the rest uh, coming into this space, uh, when it comes to education, mostly if you have a very good working knowledge in cybersecurity and you're able to speak the language, uh, you understand what is going on, you should be good for this part. So for education, don't say because uh, the traditional master's degree in IT something uh, is going to be what is going to prevent you. No, that is not going to prevent you. Right? Now, when it comes to cybersecurity knowledge, you should have a good working knowledge in cybersecurity. And what do I mean by good working knowledge? You should have a good working knowledge in all the major areas uh, when it comes to fundamental cybersecurity. So cybersecurity concepts, uh, cyber areas like networking, cryptography, identity and assets management, uh, risk management, and the rest. You should have a good working knowledge in all those areas, right? So you are not necessarily going to be a network guru or a cryptographic guru or any of those, but you have to have a good working knowledge. That way you can understand what is going on. You can understand threats uh, and, you know, the threat landscape, right? Then you can uh escalate problems when they do happen or incidents right so familiarity with uh the threat landscape is also going to help so for frameworks like uh OWASP top 10 MIDA and attack and the rest uh, is going to be your go-to 
because you have to be up to speed when it comes to threats and how to mitigate some of these threats right out there. All right. So uh, for general cybersecurity knowledge, that is what I'm going to you know talk about. Now, when it comes to technical expertise, uh, this this like SOC analyst, if you are going just within the space of the SOC tier one, tier two, tier three, is is uh, I would say is 60, 70, 80 percent you know, technical. And technical doesn't mean you are going to be doing coding. But the technical here meaning you have to understand, have a good working knowledge in cybersecurity, understand cybersecurity concepts and theories, uh, understand cybersecurity tools, right? Which tool is used for what? Now, uh, when it comes to cybersecurity tools, there are general categorizations for them. So we have SIM tools, we have vulnerability scanning tools, we have, and under those we have brand names, right? So we have brand names under those. So it's just like if we look at cars, there are different cate like categorizations. We have sedan, we have uh, SUVs, we have, but under each of those, we have brands. So Mercedes have their own SUV. Uh, Infinity will have their own SUV, right? They have their own sedan. They, so same with tools. There are same tools. Now, Q Radar is a brand name. Uh, Splunk is a brand name, right? Archa is a brand name under sim tools right now if you know how to use one of these sim tools you can literally use them all right you just need small orientation and you should be good now with some of these tools you don't have to wait to get employed before you can use them right one you can join our entry level course the hands-on training you can learn those tools or if you want to do self-study or just practice on your own some of the like some of these vendors when you go to their websites they have free versions of the tools that you can download and learn how to use on your own, right? So your experience in your like your technical proficiency in using these tools, it doesn't have to be a paid experience or you don't have to wait and say, I don't have experience, so I'm waiting to get employed, right? It's just like you telling the wood to give you fire before you actually give the wood fire to start burning and give you heat or telling the wood to give you heat before you put like you, you know, put fire on it, right? So you don't have to wait. Most people get into that space. Uh, I don't have experience and because of that, I'm not able to get jobs and stuff. But then what are you sitting at home doing? You can go to these websites, go to Splunk, go to Keyradar, go to the rest. Download these tools if you want to learn on your own. Download the free ones, figure it out. No, if not, you can join the entry level course. You know, we walk you through how to use these tools. So those are some of the ways that you can learn these tools, right? So. Anybody on here who wants to go this route, when it comes to tools, uh, please don't say uh, because I didn't officially work in the cybersecurity space or somewhere I don't know any of these tools. You know them. And one of the tools that everybody also underestimates all the time, and I think Michael mentioned it last time, Excel. Learn how to use Excel. I mean, nobody's going to teach you Excel in any company. For tools, Splunk and the rest, they are going to orient you or teach you. But for Excel, PowerPoint, because you are going to be doing reports, PowerPoint, Word document, I mean, those you can learn on your own. Or go to YouTube, somebody is there teaching Excel 101 uh, and the rest, right? So when it comes to tools, just know the tools, know the categorization, know the brand names, and familiarize yourself with some of these tools. I mean, I've given you uh all those uh that information that is really going to help set you apart already so when it comes to analytical skills uh you have to really be on top of your game so one you have to pay attention to detail you have to be somebody who loves to research you have to be curious right research is the key right because problems you are going to run into uh you always have to dig into it research more about it uh for you to be able to move it up or handle it at your level. So you are responsible for monitoring. Uh, you are, we are going to be dealing with a lot of data. So how do you, you know, uh, go through this data and make sense out of it? Although you have automated systems that are going to help you do that, but if you still can't analyze, you know, the data that you have been presented with or the summary of data you have been presented with, then you know you are not going to be as effective. Right? So uh, being analytical. Uh, mostly I'll say it's a skill that you can easily learn. And as you are, if you have some of it or you are just being curious, 
like your curiosity is really going to push you to that level. Right? And as you are working, you are going to gain some more tips and tricks on how to easily, you know, uh, because you would have seen most of the issues and problems and patterns already, right? So it's very easy to make a good judgment calls on those. And communication skills uh, super is super needed. Right, communication skills is super needed because you are not going to be working alone. You are going to be working at. We saw that like the whole table. Everybody who is involved in the SOC uh, group, right? A lot of people and a lot of communication between different teams. So strong uh, written and verbal communication skills is needed. So when you look at SOC analyst uh, job descriptions, when you look at the skills portion, you see uh, that strong written and verbal communication skills. Right, presentation skills. Uh, so they will say, yeah, oral or verbal communication skills. So it is very needed because you are going to work in with different groups. And then also when there's a problem and you have to push it up the hierarchy, you have to be able to break it down and explain for them to exactly uh, get what you are trying to put across, right? Because uh, if you are not able to describe what is going on well, how well do you think they'll be able to also take it up and, you know, try to fix it. So uh, great communication skills is also needed here. Now your analytical skills and great communication skills can be from any other field, bringing it into cybersecurity, right? So all those are transferable skills. Now let's look at the types of security operation centers. We have the traditional dedicated self-managed security operation centers. Example is what we looked at. So your company has a building or a, a, a room, you know, where they've set up everything and uh, your analysts are there monitoring traffic and uh, responding to alerts. And we have the distributed uh, SOC. So the distributed one, uh, we have it where we have our own in-house uh, security operation centers and we've outsourced uh, part of our security operation center operations to a managed uh, security service provider, right, MSSP. And there's another one, the command uh, SOC. That is, with the command SOC, like the example that we saw, the hub and the spokes, uh, mostly with the hub, they will gather intelligence and they will distribute it to the different subnets, right? So uh, mostly they don't actually do the responding and the rest. They are just there to collect intelligence and distribute it to the other uh, subdivisions, right? And then we have the fusion center. This is an advanced, uh subgroup uh, because it's a combination of you know some uh, also other mini subgroups and different teams coming together to form that fusion center and we have multifunctional uh so uh, soc so multifunctional uh SOC team you know will also uh include a dedicated facility and then also an in-house staff uh that with together with a group like the group that we saw almost everybody also uh forming part of this and we have our virtual uh, security operation center where there is no physical building. Everybody is working from home, from different locations, right? But we are still able to get the job done. Now, this is very common. The virtual SOC is very common. And we have the security operation center as a service, right? Now we have as a service for everything, as a service. So this, you can, uh, some companies have come up with software that is able to help manage your service center operations uh, just strictly through that software. And they have some uh, SOC analysts on their side who will help to, if there is any problem, they will go through the steps, escalate it to SOC, two, uh, SOC, SOC tier two, tier three, right? Uh, so that is also uh, a way that we handle our SOC operations now. Now, when we look at, uh, we are going to look at some of the SOC as a service. So with SOC as a service, uh, some of the vendor or the brand names, because SOC as a service is a software, right? So if you, we go back a little bit to our deployments uh, in the cloud, like we go back to our cloud lessons, when you, you like you look at the different models, uh, we have uh, uh, platform as a service, infrastructure as a service, software as a service, now, SOC as a service is part of software as a service. It's under software as a service, right? So these companies, they come up with this software and it will act as your sub operation, as your uh, security operation center, 
right? So uh, some of the brand names here is what we have in this list. Uh, Arctic Wolf uh, is a very big one. Uh, Rapid7, they have their own. Sophos also is a big one. Uh, Sematech is also a big one. Uh, Astra Pentest, I've not really uh, encountered a company using it, but it's also there. Uh, and Qualys is a big one. Uh, Nets, Nets Room is also a big one. So this one, I've not also seen it used anywhere, right? But they are, they are the whole list of it. Uh, everybody uh, is coming up with different products uh, of late. So you can dig more into that. Now, some of the tools yeah. aside, the software as a service, uh, the uh, software as a service version that we looked at, right? Uh, some of the tools, the typical tools that you have within your uh, security operation center is the list that we see on the screen. So SIM, uh, SIM is a big one, right? SIM is like on the top of the list when it comes to tools for your uh, security operation center. Now you have intrusion detection systems, intrusion prevention systems, your saw tools, your uh, security uh, analytics platforms, your endpoint detection uh, and response uh, tools, your vulnerability management solutions, your data loss prevention solutions, identity and access management solutions, firewalls, and the rest, right? Uh, so with these, these are some of the major categories of tools. And that these tools, they are brand names, just like the ones that we saw, right? So companies who are coming up with these tools, they have their own, you know, uh, names for their tools that they are using. So, for you to really be uh, up to speed when it comes to tools, you have to first know the different categories of tools, and then at least know one or two brand names under these categories, right? And that is not even just for a SOC analyst job or anything, but in security in general, right? Uh, that way, when it comes to tools, you go to interviews or you are on the job and they are looking for a solution and they are talking about, you know, what data loss prevention tools are you familiar with or which ones can we purchase, which is the best. First, you should know data loss prevention uh, is a category when it comes to security tools. Now, what are some of the brand names under data loss prevention? So that is what I'm referring to. Now, you can dig more into this and do your own research. And, and this Oops. is... Yeah, proof, <laughs> proof point is one of them. Yes, so you can easily, you know, dig more into this and uh, online. If you go online, there is a whole list. Everybody is trying to sell their tools. So, and some of these tools, like I said, you can download free versions of each of these categories and practice with it. Your own laptop can be your, your, uh, like your, like your work area that you are scanning that you are. You just have to know how to move around in these tools. That is all you need to do, frankly. And on the job, you can use it to do anything. So if they ask you, do you know how to use this? Of course. If you've, you've been playing around with it at home, of course you know how to use it. Because if they give you the chance and, okay, so uh, go in there, open a file, do this, do that, you'll be able to still do that. Right? So SIM solutions, uh, like I said, SIM is a big one. So that is why we are uh, just taking a look at SIM by itself. And uh, for SIM, it looks like this. So for SIM tools, unlike other tools, the SIM is not really going to produce or generate data on its own. It is going to gather data from other tools that you have and other devices and other systems. And it will just group it in one area, make sense out of it, right? Categorize it, streamline it, and it will help you uh, really uh, in real time track alerts and see what is going on overall within your organizational setup. And so for your SIM tools, it will be picking information from your routers, switches, firewalls, uh, your servers, intrusion detection systems, and the rest. And everything will be gathered here for you to just, at a glance, you'll be able to see your security posture. And uh, SOAR tools can also help you do this because now with SOAR tools, they have SIM tools inside SOAR tools, right? So uh, it's really pretty fun if, you just start digging into these tools. It's not really, uh, it's not a rocket science. So uh, even if it's rocket science, people have degrees in rocket science. So it's not something that you cannot do, right? All right, so what are some of the best practices when it comes to a winning SOC team? So your SOC team, what can you do to really make it functional and to be a winning SOC team? Uh, you have to focus on your staff and your personnel. So we've talked about all these tools, but guess what your greatest tool is in your SOC? 
uh, group or in your sub team? People, right? Who is going to work with these tools that we are talking about? Who is going to manage it? Who is going to configure it? People. So if you neglect people and you just focus on tools, you are really doing yourself a big disservice because your biggest gun in this fight is your people, not the tools that you are using. The tools will help augment everything, but it's the people who read life into the tools that you are using, right? Into the processes that you have in place. So uh, people, focusing on your people, training your people, augmenting your team with automation and machine learning, that is big. Now, most of these tools, they have their own, you know, machine learning, AI thing going on, uh, automating your workflow. So we were talking about that, like what uh, so analyst tier one, tier two, they are supposed to do. The process that they go through has to be automated. Like it has to be seamless, right? If something happens, boom, you move to this step, you move to this step. We are using this tool to send this up. We are using this to do the uh, ticketing. So we have to really uh, automate our workflow, right? To make us effective as a SOC team. And auditing uh, your environment to reduce risks. So you have to be proactive. Now this is more tier three. Uh, you have to be, be more proactive. And then also something called uh, tool sprawl. So oh, go for it. Oh, oh. All right. So uh, who knows this? What is uh, tool sprawl? Anybody? I I can check. I guess. I guess it's like um, like uh, access um, trip. <laughs> so maybe yes. just having too many tools. Uh, replicating same uh, uh, things, abilities that, you know, could maybe just be done by fewer tools than you really have. Yes, you are right. Uh, it's similar to privilege creep, right? Just compiling tools, just adding. Some companies are really uh, very skilled in this. They just keep adding tools because they think tools are going to solve all their problems and they ignore, they ignore everything else. So they just keep adding tools and now you have like tools, three tools that are doing the same thing and they don't maintain these tools well. Their certificates will expire and they don't know and nobody's tracking these tools. Now you are just increasing your attack surface and just causing more problems for yourself. So on, on, on a regular basis, you have to audit your environment for tools that are just there because they are there or somebody convinced somebody to buy it and they just bought it and they are just adding it to something that they have already, right? Uh, it's just like still get like uh, privilege people, just ha having somebody accumulate so many privileges within the organization to the point where if they get breached, we are all screwed because they have access to everything within the company. Right? So to Spra, we have to do uh, regular uh, audits to make sure, you know, the ones that we are not using or we are monitoring everything and making sure we are in control of all our tools, right? Because when it comes to the salt space, there is a lot of tools. And so if you don't keep, you know, tabs on these tools, they might get out of hand. So what are some of the best practices when it comes to your SOC team? Uh, establishing your SOC, obviously, uh, make sure you're, you're like a company has a SOC team in place, uh, developing security policies and procedures. That is more tier three. Uh, implementing or your like managerial level. So aside your tier three is going to be your security manager doing this, uh, implementing security solutions, monitoring and analyzing your logs, providing security awareness training, performing vulnerability assessment, uh, and responding to incidents. Right? So for your security best practices uh, or what every so, uh, group or team should go through is what we've just listed. So we are going to wrap up with our SOC. Maybe next time we are going to go a bit deeper into other areas of SOC, but uh, our new PCI class will be starting on in, this, in uh, October on the 16th. Uh, so you are very welcome to join us. Uh, if you go to our website, all the information is on there. And this is a career path for uh, PCI for us. Uh, you can go through, when we start the course, you go through the crash course, cybersecurity crash course to get warm and fuzzy again with cybersecurity. And then we go through our modules 
And then you finish, do your internship for two months or a month and a half, depending on which path uh, the specialist or the expert that you chose. And then also our internship, we are starting a new cohort in October as well. So you can also join us, uh, that is October 21st, right? And uh, with that, if you have some security background, uh, you want really hands-on to work on different projects, uh, incident response, audits, risk management, you know, this is the place to be. We will, we will be in groups, we pair the groups uh, with one of our sister companies and we control the projects you work on. We discuss and teach you the projects, you go work on it with your team. And then, you know, we move on to other projects. So uh, we are with that also, these are the payment options. We have a lot of different payment options on our website that you can go through, right? So this is our contact on here. Uh, please visit arithmetsacademy.com uh, if you've not already done so. And uh, you will be able to, you know, go through any of our free training as well, right? So we are going to open the floor for questions. If there are any questions or uh, any comments, or any add-ons, uh, we are going to take that before we wrap it up for tonight. I think there are some in the chats. Uh, we are yet to look at that. Okay, so uh, I don't think these were really questions. Uh, any questions for the group before we wrap up for the night? And for our interns, we are still meeting tomorrow. Same time for both groups, uh, 10 and 11 or anybody who met at 10 and 11 at the same time. All right, everyone, uh, appreciate everybody's time. So hopefully we all learned something from this. And for anyone looking to get into the uh, SOC team or to get into the SOC space, uh, there are different roles that you can leverage your skill set that you have either already in the security space or skill sets you are bringing from outside Right. Uh, so if you want to go into the very technical part, you know, uh, analyst level one, level two, uh, tier one, tier two, tier three, or consulting roles or, you know, uh, managerial roles, you can uh, handle. If you can handle any of those, uh, you can apply for those uh, areas as well. So I think most of the myth that is around the soft space has been uh, debunked or has been cleared, you know, so. Uh, I appreciate everybody's time. Elikum, go ahead, and we will wrap it up. Yeah, I, I don't actually have a question, but I just wanted to let you know I'm sending you a text, so please take a look. Okay, 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 very well. Thank you. Very well. All right, I appreciate everybody's time. Have a great weekend. Dr. Uh, Dr. Hello. Hello. Yes, go ahead. Sorry, uh, please. Um, uh, if you are a cybersecurity analyst, right, can okay. you also work as, as a sort? Can you work? in the SOC environment. Say that again, please. If you're a cybersecurity analyst, right, mm -hmm. um, can you work as a, like, can you work in, in the SOC environment? So uh, everybody working in the SOC environment is a cybersecurity professional. So okay. if it's like, it's just a job title, you can work as a cybersecurity analyst, you can work as a SOC analyst, but virtually uh, you are doing, depending on where you are working, you are doing similar things or the goal behind what you are doing is almost the same, right? So uh, if you're like, at the end of the day, you're a cybersecurity professional, whether you are working as an incident responder, you are working as a third party risk management, whatever, you are working as uh, so two tier one, what, you are all cybersecurity professionals. So uh, it's not really, you know, most people, we should get out of that space of labeling ourselves with job titles because um, job titles are only job titles. Hopefully that helps. Sure, thank you. Yes, so uh, you, are, you are not doing something uh, really outside cyber screening. They, are, they all fall under cyber screening. And I think somebody was asking for the, the number for the WhatsApp group. And also we have a WhatsApp group, if you want to be part of it. Uh, the number is on there, you can send a request and we will add you to it. So we posted the number in the chat, we can add you to the group. That way, when we send out invitations for uh, for cyber chat and the rest, you have access to it. So uh, I think there is a number in here, Rod. Okay, so Rod, uh, please kindly send on, like, 
send a message. Okay, okay. So whenever you are done, uh, we are going to take note of your number. And whenever you are done, you can uh, always, you know, send a test to this number and they will add you to it. All right, everyone. I appreciate everybody's time. Have a great weekend. Uh, we are going to meet next week. Can we have Somebody has a question. Re Richard, can we have the recording? Can we have the recording of this? Yes, like the recording will be posted. Uh, it will be sent out when it is ready. But we were streaming live on YouTube. So if you go to our YouTube channel, uh, Arrhythmus Academy on YouTube, you will see the live stream as well, right? And I entreat everybody to also go in there, and uh, subscribe to the channel and promote it because uh, that is how uh, other folks are also able to benefit from this, right? And then also our intent of spreading cybersecurity knowledge is also going to get far. Appreciate everybody's time. Any without any more questions, we are wrapping it up. Go ahead, Felix. Uh, Felix. Yeah, as soon as I got to know Rizmi, it was just a, <laughs> I mean, searching on the internet on the YouTube that I got, I fell onto you. Okay, okay. So I <laughs> yeah, think everybody I, on here should subscribe. I, 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 to our trying, I, uh, I'm trying to get in contact with Michael. Mm -hmm. I sent him my private text, but it's like he's not seen it. Uh, please, Michael, can you? Check your. I send the private text to you on this uh, on this chat. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, uh, I'll look into that, Felix. Uh, okay. All right. All right. Thank you. All right, all right, everyone. I appreciate everybody's time, but please go ahead and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, that way, Felix and others can find it again. All right. <laughs> yeah. All right. I appreciate everybody's time. Have a great weekend, and we'll meet again next week Friday for another edition of Cyber Chats. Have a great one, everyone. All right, thank Bye. you. Thank you. Guys.